Okay, I'm Reed Robison. I'm a psychiatrist from Utah and happy to be here chatting about one of my favorite topics, psychedelic medicine. I have been uh, working with psychedelics, if you count ketamine, for about 10 years or so um, in clinical practice mostly. I'll, I'll talk a little more of that, but as a psychiatrist, I find them especially interesting because of the light they shine on the dark corners of ourselves or how they help us understand ourselves better. Um, this is a quote that sums it up well by one of the thought leaders, pioneers in the modern psychedelic movement, Stan Groff. Psychedelics are to the study of the mind what the microscope is to biology and the telescope is to astronomy. And so this has been a source of uh, kind of concern for me for a long time is that uh, current treatment options for things like depression, uh, anxiety, PTSD, just fall short for so many people. I started out my career uh, after finishing my psychiatry training doing clinical trials, studying new medicines um, for depression, bipolar, everything, everything in the psychiatric realm. But they're not even as good as a coin toss for the most part. Like response rates for a typical antidepressant uh, are usually under 50%, and then you have a placebo response of upwards of 20%. So they, they help somewhat, and they help some people, and I use them when needed, no, no question, but we need more, we need better options. And that's, that's why this uh, psychedelic renaissance is especially exciting to me, because it presents these new options. If you look at uh, psilocybin, for example, and I'll show some of this data, but it is uh, kind of blowing away treatment as usual without even having to take a daily pill and using a, a plant-based product or a synthetic analog of something found in nature. Um, so this is, uh, I work with a company called Novamind as chief medical officer and we build clinics and retreats to enable access to psychedelic medicine but mostly we do it through the mental health care system so people can use their insurance or so we can provide it in, in an accessible way. And right now that looks like ketamine uh, or Spravato, which is a, an FDA approved form of, of ketamine, S-ketamine for depression and suicidal ideation. Um, but uh, coming soon and in research settings is psilocybin for depression, end-of-life anxiety, other things, MDMA for PTSD. Uh, some, some results were just announced last week by MAPS um, that are even more exciting and further the, the momentum of what uh, MDMA is doing uh, and MAPS is doing to change the game in mental health and provide uh, drastically improved options. So um, right now we have clinics in Utah, uh, four uh, currently open, eight by the summer, and we're expanding here to Denver next and the area. So um, this is uh, kind of my story through working with psychedelic medicines. Started working with ketamine, I think my first grant or study was in 2011. And uh, led a clinical trial for Janssen using IV ketamine. And I got to sit with so many people during their ketamine experiences. This is like over a 90 minute journey. And, uh, and in a clinical trial, we capture things really carefully. So uh, I got to ask them questions about what that experience was like, what's happening to time and space and colors and shapes and uh, all sorts of perceptual changes. But it was striking to me, having done a bunch of clinical trials to that point uh, that were underwhelming, to see that like in these studies, 70% of the time, people had a rapid improvement in mood. Um, and mind you, with ketamine, it's not a classic psychedelic. It's, it's an interesting medicine, and I, I have used it um, 
you know, very enthusiastically in practice and had so many people have significant benefits from it. But I'm even more excited about what's coming next. And, uh, and I'll talk about some of the differences. And then I started working with ayahuasca a few years ago in retreat settings out of the country where, where I can. And uh, I've been the coordinating investigator for a MAP study of MDMA for eating disorders. We're doing anorexia and binge eating disorder. And then uh, I'm working on getting the, the state of Utah and the DEA's approval to begin a psilocybin study or a series of psilocybin studies, hopefully by this summer in Utah. And so the future does look bright for psychedelic medicine. Um, here's some data from the PTSD research I was talking about. So these are individuals with severe PTSD who entered uh, an MDMA-assisted psychotherapy study where they got two or three doses of MDMA and a bunch of therapy. If you look at six, 12 months later, upwards of 70% of the time, they no longer even met criteria for PTSD. Um, and data from uh, the most recent batch of studies showed the same thing. There was a New York Times article about it and a lot of media coverage. So it looks like uh, MAPS used to estimate pre-COVID that uh, MDMA might gain FDA approval by next year. The more recent estimates are more like 2023. And when it does come out, so MDMA is one that is not legal anywhere in the world except under a couple conditions. I'll talk more about that, but under research and compassionate use or expanded access. Um, so we can go to, say, Mexico or Costa Rica and work with ayahuasca. We can go to the Netherlands or Jamaica and work with psilocybin. But where can you go to work with uh, MDMA? That's one of the kind of tragic consequences of the overscheduling of these medicines decades ago under Nixon and others, but um, I won't begin on that rant. Um, this is a uh, treatment-resistant depression study out of Imperial College in London. Um, two doses of psilocybin plus therapy led to improvements in mood within a week, so a lot faster than treatment as usual, and benefits seen three, six months later, and even more. And so as a, as a psychiatrist prescribing uh, pills that have to be taken daily, this is exciting. This is, this is game changing. And if you look at uh, safety profiles, I don't um, need to even tell you this. I think it's well known that these are extremely safe medicines compared to what's out there, um, like alcohol and uh, so many other medicines. And, and they did get, unfortunately, uh, over-regulated uh, back in the 60s, 70s. Um, so let's talk about a few of these. This is the family tree of psychedelics. Um, debatable, I know who's who, and I don't even know. I think this is an Archie Bunker cartoon, um, but uh, we're gonna talk about, I'll go into some detail on MDMA, ketamine, and psilocybin, and ayahuasca, uh, the ones that I work with in research settings. And if you're not familiar with these two books by Shulgin, Pical, and Tikal, um, they go into an extremely fascinating amount of depth about these medicines and so many other research chemicals, both uh, how he synthesized them and how what his experience was like as he tried them um, with uh, friends and family over and over and documented those journeys. Um, and so while these have been around for eons, um, psychedelic medicines and uh, these tools for awakening, um, we're just starting to understand them more and more over the past, say, century or two. And I'll talk about some of the history of the ones I dive into a bit more, but I find it interesting to look at, just for a second, how hallucinations occur. Um, so if you, if, if you look at classic psychedelics versus 
other things like say methamphetamine induced psychosis. It's a completely different mechanism. So if someone ingests a street dose of meth, it's a surge of dopamine and that kind of hallucination or that kind of uh, uh, trip comes with paranoia more typically. But if you if you give someone ketamine, it's a dissociative anesthetic, works through glutamate, and it has uh, you know, more of a visual picture than uh, these psychostimulants might have more of an auditory picture. Classic psychedelics hit the serotonin receptor, especially 5-HD2A, cause a rush of serotonin, creating this kind of visual mystical type hallucination. Um, but with it comes some built-in insight. So one of the common things I'll, I'll hear by people coming out of psilocybin journeys, ayahuasca experiences are, wow, why is this plant illegal when it just gives me insight about how to improve my life? Um, and I know, I know personally when I first experienced ayahuasca, I came back and, and uh, well, even like immediately the next day, um, it was laughable for me to try and buy a packaged food that's not recognizable or I just couldn't bring myself to buy paper plates or plastic cutlery. It just, it was out of my vocabulary, like knocked out of there. I have some people who come out of that and they've smoked like a hundred thousand cigarettes, boom, gone. Um, you, you see that with, uh, with Ibogaine and opiate addiction, but it's, it's a radical change in perspective and, and psych classic psychedelics come with this, this insight, um, which I find fascinating. So if you look at LSD as an example, we recently had uh, Bicycle Day, which was um, last month, I believe just before 420. And it commemorates a day when Albert Hoffman, who discovered synthesized LSD. Um, at first he accidentally dipped his finger in it and went on a wild adventure. Then he purposefully took 250 micrograms, kind of a double dose or a good sized dose, and uh, started started a kind of a wild trip. Um, it was pretty intense, so he asked his lab assistant to accompany him as he got on his bike and rode home. And um, it was fascinating and also terrifying at times. Um, so a quote from Albert Hoffman, I then slept to awake the next morning with a clear head, a sensation of well-being and renewed life flowed through me. So this is what happened next, like the next morning. Breakfast tasted delicious, gave me extraordinary pleasure. Later when I walked out in the garden in which the sun shone now after a spring rain, everything glistened and sparkled in a fresh light. The world was as if newly created. Um, so interesting because LSD after that was sent around to psychiatrists across the US and Canada saying, use this in therapy and also to researchers saying, use this to study psychosis because it can make someone psychotic, but it can also make someone uh, you know, see the world in a new way and have a fresh kind of re renewed perspective. Um, and so that's what people did, uh, mostly uh, as a therapy aid. Um, in the 60s, it was given to thousands of, uh, of individuals with alcoholism, for example, and, and just had drastic improvements compared to the usual way of treating things. Even the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson, um, 1956, had an LSD experience. Um, and he had this vision of individuals with alcoholism kind of chained together uh, across the globe, but helping each other. And it was just this striking kind of experiential waking up where he was able to shake his alcoholism. And he tried to get the board to sign on to endorse it or use it as a tool because of the AA model was about giving people a spiritual experience, but then, uh, he, not everyone could access one, but if you look at things like the Good Friday experiment at Harvard, where psilocybin was given in a uh, church setting, it and then the Hopkins studies since then, even recently, these tools are able to occasion mystical spiritual experiences predictably. And uh, if you look at uh, some of the writings of Carl Jung, he was pre-psychedelics, but he would say things like when working with alcoholism, if only I could 
bring about a mystical spiritual exper experience reliably for people. Um, and then along came uh, psychedelics, even though they've gone through this, this um, period of um, no research, uh, very hard to access, um, they're coming back. They're coming back in, uh, in a very exciting way. And so these, this is just a summary of uh, the ways uh, psychedelics are used or can be used. And the first, the first one isn't really, isn't really used anymore as a, as a model of psychosis. But the psycholytic um, approach is like a low dose to facilitate openness and therapy and uh, the higher doses to go on a journey, to go inward and come out with uh, insight and perspective. Um, so how do they work? I'll look at this from a couple perspectives, neuroscience and uh, more from a, a through a psychological lens. So we all have these patterns laid down early in our lives. Um, you know, we're born with, the, with uh, our genomes and our, our nature, and then comes nurture. It's always both. So we're, we're shaped into who we are through a combination of our, our genes and our experiences, our family, um, upbringing, uh, and that leads to a bunch of unconscious patterns. These can be great, these can be less adaptive, uh, but psychedelics can help shine a light on what we do and why and where these things come from, and uh, also give you a blank slate to work with. So I like to sometimes com compare them to a uh, ski slope. So psychedelics, you know, if you go down a a ski slope, there are these tracks that become indentations that become um, tracks that people follow over and over and moguls and whatnot. And then psychedelics come like a fresh coat of powder where the next time you go down, you can consciously choose the course and chart that down the mountain um, without just slipping into the same ruts as before. And if you look at, uh, we were talking earlier about psychedelics versus uh, traditional antidepressants. Let's look at Prozac as an example. Prozac also works on a serotonin receptor, um, but the result is emotional blunting. You know, it, it, sure, it can improve someone's anxiety, OCD, depression, but uh, at, at a price. Um, and again, I don't want to minimize these because they can become life-saving tools for some people and they have been uh, a much needed addition to our treatment regimen. Um, but if we look to the future of when we can use these things more and more, um, psychedelics, their mechanism is more of a, an enhanced emotional experience. Um, so an enhanced sensitivity plus processing stuck emotions, combine that with therapy, and you have a, a recipe for healing and transformation and growth. Um, and so this is uh, just another way of looking at it. Psychedelics hit a serotonin receptor, a rush of serotonin re release, kind of a loosening of the mind, like a dissolving of the ego, a breaking down of the chains that keep us stuck. Um, along with this insight that comes from the medicine leading to an increase uh, in optimism, hope, and uh, awareness of what to do next, how to live our lives in a way, um, in a way that's more conscious. And so to sum it up so far, psychedelics do create this, this psychological and brain state that can really accelerate therapy and uh, this, there's some research coming out of Imperial College um, led by a, a researcher named Robin Carhart Harris. And he summed it up, he called it rebus, a relaxed belief under psychedelics. So um, our brains generate these mental models because uncertainty is difficult. We never know what's going to happen. Our brains have evolved to try and predict what's happening. And these things get layered on top of each other. So sensory inputs come in, and based on our past experiences, we um, act in a, in a way that we think is consistent with our survival. It may be from old patterns or times in our life where we needed to, to protect ourselves in a certain way. They may not be serving us well now. Um, so if you look at psychedelics, 
kind of, you could say, heat up the brain, increasing the malleability or plasticity. And then as the brain cools back down, we can, we have this window of opportunity to decide what we want to do in our lives. Like if you have addictive patterns, they're kind of melted away and you can, if you don't do anything with that, they're just gonna snap back into place. You know, you can go right back to where you started after psychedelics, but you can also choose to show up in life in a different way. And that's where this concept of integration comes in and becomes so important. And so a couple other concepts to mention, uh, you probably, heard a lot about, might be very familiar with, but my take on set and setting, um, key factors in the psychedelic experience. Uh, I like to remember that psychedelic medicines are like amplifiers of what's going on in your psyche. So if you're going in super anxious, uh, just be aware of the very real chance that that anxiety might be blown up. You know, you can do some things to try and uh, regulate your nervous system, self-soothe, and work on that beforehand. It doesn't take long. These are important practices to cultivate before going into psychedelic experiences, like, like meditation practices, um, for example. So it's also important not to, to let go of expectations as much as possible. I know that's easier said than done, but, but when, we, uh, when we go in trying to control things on psychedelics, that's just a recipe for having a fight with yourself, right? You've got to kind of sign on for the ride and know that you're safe and let yourself go where it's going to take you, knowing that it's going to be over in a matter of hours or minutes or whatever medicine you're taking. Um, and so this is where doing your homework beforehand or the education piece beforehand becomes extremely important. Um, and I like to help people do a little of this uh, contemplative work right before going in. Like we can till the soil of that by doing some breathing practices, some guided meditation work to find uh, where the important work is, um, to find the intention that's already there that is important to you. Um, and we talk about intention in psychedelics and um, it's, a, it's an interesting one because you don't want to go in with too much uh, attempt to control or too much of an expectation, but an, an intention can also be your anchor as you go through this experience when confused, when uh, struggling, coming back to that ideally a simple um, statement or word or intention of what you're looking to kind of will into life or manifest in your life. Um, and so this is... Uh, how I'll work with people on an intention the first time they're going in is um, keep making it as simple as possible, writing it down, making it real, looking for what's really true for you. And it might be something like, show me my, my fear or teach me about my anger, help me with X, Y, Z. And then it could be a difficult emotion, an essential quality, peace, love, uh, help me with with love, with, uh, you know, show me my barriers to love inside myself, for example. And then the setting is more about what surrounds you. Um, if you're going to go take a large dose of a psychedelic medicine in at Disneyland or the Las Vegas Strip, um, you've got to be um, aware of these amplifiers are going to blow that up, that the intensity of that experience and magnify it. Um, and also being aware of the fact that when, if you're in the middle of a psychedelic medicine journey and your, your neighbor knocks on the door you know, with a casserole or you're, you know, someone comes needing you to help them jump their car battery, just being aware of, of what might happen. And you can't control it all, of course, but you can be conscious about when and how and where you use these things, which can be extremely important. And also just things like physical comfort, uh, uh, temperature, regulation. Like I've seen so many people go into say ayahuasca experiences and just be so distracted from the experience because um, they're either freezing or they 
can't get comfortable, can't sit still, and it's hard to do deep work when distracted like that. Um, music is another uh, important factor, we won't get into too much, but it can be like the wind in the sails of a psychedelic experience, and, um, and you know, it's, it's interesting to think about how different music is, like if you're comparing um, like hard rock or rap to, you know, non-lyrical, more, uh, you know, ambient uh, music, classical music, things like that. And, and it's a personal thing. So I've had people go into psychedelic experiences or, or ketamine journeys just with, uh, you know, a very strong connection to something like the Beatles or Holland Oates or who, whomever, which, which is, uh, t it's an individual thing. It's totally fine. But uh, in general, I'd say non-lyrical um, tends to be less distracting than uh, otherwise. And so remembering that if you're facilitating or guiding or working in this setting, you're part of the setting and your energy matters and checking yourself before you go into that room. So you're bringing the right presence. Um, and just a word on, on ceremony and ritual. Uh, so, like we were talking about, life can be, um, life has a lot of uncertainty, full of mystery, right? Especially the last year or two. We have no idea when the world's opening up or what, what life is going to look like in a year or two. But uh, through the ages, people have turned to rituals, ceremonies, uh, as ways to um, make sense of the uncertainty or manage the discomfort that comes with that. Like uh, when people gather as a, with their loved ones every Sunday for dinner or when they you know, wake up and do a practice, uh, a yoga or meditation practice, or have something uh, comforting that, they can, that can anchor them through this uh, kind of uncertain path in life, that can be... Um, extremely helpful. And so the point of uh, bringing this up is that psychedelics traditionally have been used in ceremonial ways and uh, like as a ritual. And I think there's a lot of value and beauty in that, even if it seems out of our comfort zone, even, even if we're not used to bells and gongs and chimes and you know, like chanting or meditation or whatever it may be those things there's uh there's a beauty in it there's a value in it and uh, embracing that if you're participating in say ceremonial use of ayahuasca um, it might it might seem weird to watch a documentary or a youtube video on how these things happen but but knowing that uh that we as humans for ages have sought out things like sweat lodges or um, it's even the reason people gather together at church to uh, even though most people, you know, most religions, they're just trying to make sense of what we don't know and and uh, many paths up the same mountain, but it's an attempt to uh, kind of to sacramentalize the mystery of life and the discomfort. Um, and so Another quote I love, in the sunlight of awareness, everything becomes sacred. So you could be, you know, washing the dishes and having a mind-blowing, enlightened experience. Um, and uh, ritual and ceremony helps us remember that. So uh, I'll fly through ketamine for a moment because um, it's an interesting one. It's one that's available now. It's helping to open the door to psychedelic medicine, especially mental health, and it's creating the infrastructure. So now um, in, uh, in mental health clinics, you can go in seeking a psychedelic experience, put on headphones, eye mask, get a dose of ketamine by injection or IV or lozenge, nasal spray have an hour journey, have a therapist to process things with, fully legal, um, even uh, a form of ketamine, like I mentioned, Spravato is covered by insurance. We've given it 3,000 times in clinics in Utah since it came out, every single one of them covered by insurance. Ketamine, not so much because it started as an anesthetic. It's not technically approved for these mental health uses, so it's more of a out-of-pocket kind of thing. When MDMA hits the market in one, two, three years, whenever it does, 
that uh, I don't know how long it will take, but insurances will, in some situations, sign on and cover that cost of treatment. There's already research done by MAPS about the cost effectiveness of a several thousand dollar course of MDMA. Um, and what it can do to re even just reduce the cost of someone's health care, let, let alone what it can do to help with their quality of life. Um, and so these are the ways I work with ketamine in clinic, um, using it in a psychedelic way, like in that inner work, headphones, eye mask, uh, supported by therapists. Approach will also give it in a lozenge or nasal spray before someone goes into therapy and to facilitate openness. You might have walls, inability to let yourself go to traumatic parts of yourself or, or old difficult memories, but this can open that up for access and be a therapy accelerator. And then the last bucket is sometimes we'll just give these medicines, especially ketamine, as a rapid antidepressant or when someone's in crisis. Um, and I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip over how ketamine works. My email will be on the last slide. I'll leave it up. Happy to share these if you want. Um, but uh, let's talk about MDMA. So. First synthesized in 1912, didn't really get used much. It sat on laboratory shelves, um, the first animal study in the 50s. Then uh, it wasn't really going anywhere, but Shulgin, I was talking about earlier, reverse engineered it, figure out how to make it. It's not that hard to make, it turns out. Lots of ways to approach it. Um, and uh, But then people liked it a little too much. Uh, enthusiastic uh, supporters in club settings and everything else combined with this political climate um, led it to become banned as a Schedule One substance, but then now it's coming back through clinical trials, will likely gain approval in the coming years. Um, an interesting one, not a classic psychedelic per se, but more of an empathogen um, leading to release of uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, oxytocin. And uh, what this does is it helps you trust yourself, trust the therapist you're working with, trust your partner. In couples therapy, this is an amazing tool and used to be used that way quite a bit before it was illegal. Uh, because it turns down the amygdala, your fear center, your alarm bells go off less so you can do the work. You can revisit traumatic memories, process those emotions, and release them once and for all. Um, it helps you move towards your emotions that we might fear in our culture rather than you know, swatting them away over and over. Um, this is uh, the study I'm coordinating for maps of MDMA for eating disorders, where it shows that you know, we'll do a bunch of therapy. I put this up to show the importance of, of therapy combined with these things. Um, is absolutely, it makes um, a tremendous difference because we've seen people use these tools in club settings over and over and not, for the most part, not heal their trauma like we're seeing in the, in the PTSD studies. And the difference is we're using it with intention consciously and combined with the psychological support to make that happen. And so this shows the three different dosing sessions, but there are three therapy sessions in between every one. They're separated by a month. It's not like someone's taking a pill and then it's, it's done. Um, more work is in the therapy than actually taking the medicine. And uh, MDMA, as I mentioned, is not legal anywhere except um, under these research and compassionate use um, avenues. So in the US, this is how it works. If the only way to access MDMA legally is through a clinical research study, like phase three PTSD studies or these other studies, or there are expanded use compassion access programs. Also, um, not very practically um, easy to access, but there are 10 sites across the US that are expanded access, compassionate use sites where they can give it outside of a research study to a certain number of people with PTSD for now. And that, uh, that will just, so there is a way outside of studies, it's just not widespread and, and is not going to get to that many people who need it. Um, 
let's talk about I think I think we're running out of time I will skip over ayahuasca talk about psilocybin because I know that was the topic of the last panel and a really interesting one so um, there was a, a famous issue of Time Life magazine where um, Gordon Wasson, a uh, mycologist, he was a uh, well-known VP at JP Morgan. He went with his wife down to Mexico to see this infamous uh, mushroom guide, Maria Sabina, because uh, he'd heard about these powerful healing rituals and she you know, welcomed them in, even said, sure, he can take some pictures. Um, and uh, his life was transformed. So he published an article about magic mushrooms. And this is kind of what, what kicked off the interest in it at a time when um, it was around the same time that Bill Wilson was taking LSD for his alcoholism, for example. And so then word got out through this magazine cover issue and people started flocking down to access psilocybin in that way. Um, and so fast forward until now, um, psilocybin research is back. People uh, and outside of research settings look at what the, the decriminalization movements are doing here. In, in Colorado, look at Oregon uh, legalizing it for therapy ahead of when even the FDA, the FDA is going to take, again, two years at least to approve psilocybin. I'm, uh, I just submitted the first part of my Schedule One application to do a research study of psilocybin for depression in Utah, and that's going to take three, four months just to get the stamp of approval, just to start the study in Utah. Um, so things are going at a, at a, what feels like in the moment, a painfully slow pace, but it's moving yeah, after decades of things being in the dark. Um, and so if you look at the past couple of years, it's been incredible to see the progress like politically and scientifically. Um, and so, I'll just uh, leave it at this because this was talked about in the last panel. Um, Terrence McKenna, so people often ask about uh, what does the dose in a psilocybin study mean? Like you talk about 25 milligrams of psilocybin was given at Johns Hopkins for end of life anxiety and X 70% had you know, a mystical experience, one of the most meaningful of their life. Um, if you look at uh, 20 milligrams of synthetic psilocybin or extracted psilocybin is maybe about three grams of dried magic mushrooms. Um, and uh, if you give if you give 25 to 30 milligrams uh, to an average individual of psilocybin, most of them, like four out of five in these studies, have one of the most meaningful spiritual experience of their lives. You know, the fact that we can occasion these is, is striking to me. And what it means for helping people get unstuck is incredible. And so um, if you look at the studies that have been done and the doses, I've kind of summarized it in a few categories here. Low dose, um, micro dose and above might be useful for problem solving, creativity, medium dose, therapeutic work. Uh, it, and then the higher doses for that complete ego dissolution, um, kind of rebooting uh, your ego structures and having that complete mystical experience um, with some serious insight about life. Um, and so the, there's a book by Jack Cornfield that says, after ecstasy, the laundry. He wasn't really talking about MDMA, but I like, I like the saying, um, because after, in the Buddhist circles, they'll say, before enlightenment, chop, carry wood, after enlightenment, chop, carry wood. You go have a mind-blowing experience, then what? It's, it's uh, one thing to feel this outpouring of love in the moment, but what does it really do in your day-to-day -day life? And so that's where the magic meets the road in psychedelic medicine is how do you integrate it? How do you take those changes, bring them into your life returned to more of a state of wholeness. And, uh, and so I like, when working with people, I like to um, look at, say, four pillars of well-being. You know, what's your connection to self? Looking at mental, 
emotional, physical? What's your connection to your community, to nature, to spirituality, and also looking at how might you get in your own way, because we like to do that as humans. Um, we've got really good mental acrobatics and ability to, you know, trip ourselves up by overthinking things. And so um, being aware of that and navigating them consciously, and I'll just leave it, leave it at this. There's my email if you want to reach out, and, uh, and I'll, as a closing thought, you know, I do view psychedelics not as drugs, but as, as uh, roadmaps to improve ourselves. So thank you for listening. Yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. And if you're, it, it depends on the medicine. If you look at, say, the work people do with ayahuasca, we have no idea what the dose is. I mean, there are studies about how much is in an average cup of ayahuasca, um, but it's all over the map. If you look at the, the psilocybin work, it gets a lot more clear because we know exactly what people got in a given study at Hopkins or uh, Imperial College, things like that. Um, so I would say to get to that state, though, of dissolving ego structures, don't have to be completely dissolved. Medium dose or above kind of opens up that that window of neuroplasticity, that window of opportunity to, and that rebooted uh, blank slate that we talked about. So if that's, uh, yeah, if that's psilocybin, maybe you're two, three grams. If it's ketamine, maybe you're 50 to 75 milligrams, depending on how you take it, like in an injection. If it's ayahuasca, who knows? If it's DMT, uh, you're probably getting there, but it's so brief that it's it also translates into uh, less of a less of a duration of a window for many people. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, yeah, yeah. I think I've looked at those, and you can acquire them. They're hundreds of dollars for a like a original copy of these but uh yeah it's a neat point in history uh so another question yeah yeah real quick um i guess from history you can tell there's a lot of established synthetics in the, mm -hmm. um, is that evolving with some of these natural products so the, one of the kind of unfortunate um parts of our uh, drug development process here in the U.S. is that uh, you can't really study like psilocybin as a whole fungi product, at least until all the work has been done of the individual chemicals. It would take, well, way too long, decades to, like if you look at um, the THC products that came to market, they're either, it's, it's the one molecule that people are studying because the FDA gets really jumpy about. We have to know what this specific psilocybin molecule is doing. Um, and so therefore, it's all synthetic. All the, the psilocybin research is being done is just lab-made psilocybin. Um, the depression research by Compass and USONA. Um, and uh, so it becomes you know, for whatever reason, lots of reasons, but it becomes unfortunately very difficult to study these whole plants like ayahuasca as a drug development product um, because of all the th things at play. And there are a lot of benefits in the other compounds, as we know. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, that will follow. It's first, what is what does uh, psilocybin do for say treatment resistant depression as a chemical compound but but i can imagine you know as the government opens up the possibility of more research you know we can see some of the more like fungi based or plant based products being studied but that's going to take some time yeah
And I think we have a panel starting, well, we, I think in five minutes. So maybe another question? Yeah. Yeah, um, you mentioned, sorry, when LSD first came around, it was being used to treat uh, polyuse disorder with pills and MDA. Um, you know, obviously it's been illegal. Do you, with the research into psychedelics, do you see um, successful rates of treating uh, alcoholism and addiction as well? Like, are there certain ones that do that better than others? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So most of these medicines tend to be much more anti-addictive than addictive, uh, but there are unique signatures to each of them. Um, like they say that ayahuasca might have an edge in helping people process stuck emotions, kind of like MDMA does, more of an empathogenic quality. Ketamine does a little of that. Uh, Ibogaine, on the other hand, uh, helps people and there's lots of overlap, help people see their patterns more clearly. And so that becomes extra helpful in addiction work to see how these kind of automatic subconscious patterns play out. So that's why, you know, Ibogaine is traditionally used, you know, there are clinics all over Mexico giving it for opiate addiction. But um, in general, like these are tools and therapy accelerators that give us access to the inner healing in ourselves. So you can use any of them, in my opinion, for addiction work, and they're all, they're all, uh, they all have the potential to be very powerful when combined with the right therapy. So I have a, a friend doing a combination of psilocybin plus motivational enhancement uh, therapy for addiction. And we're about to do a study of uh, psilocybin and a mindfulness oriented study for opiate use. Um, and I'd love to bring Ibogaine to clinic and study that, but uh, psilocybin just has a bit of a head start in its availability to get as a research chemical. Um, although, uh, to your point, um, it's wildly expensive as a research chemical, even though you know, in theory, it's not that hard to make, but I just um, reserved one gram of synthetic psilocybin for $5,000, and that was a pretty good deal. And that's maybe 40 doses, so, yeah. All right, well, thank you. We'll be doing a panel here in a minute, and I'll be participating in that. We can pick up where we left off, so.